Hey everyone, in this quick tutorial, I'm going to explain what liquidity is um, and how it uh, works and some of the risks associated with illiquidity. Okay, firstly, what is liquidity? Liquidity is a measure of how fast you can get in and out of an investment, but it also is a measure of the price or the ability to get in and out of that investment at a reasonable price. I find it's best to explain, explain liquidity with an example. Okay, so here we have a list of different things that you might invest in or things that you might put your money into. So we have the more liquid uh, investments or assets at the top here, and we have less liquid assets at the bottom. So these ones would be easier to get in and out of quickly, and these ones would be more difficult or time consuming. So let's go through them. The top we have cash accounts. So this could be a savings account at a bank, Let's use an example, you go to a, a retailer and you purchase something. Generally, you can get that money within a few seconds or the retailer will receive your money within a few seconds. So that is a very liquid asset. That is your cash in the bank is very liquid because it is easy to get the money in and out of. The next one is a term deposit. So when you enter a term deposit, typically you'll enter it for a specific amount of time. So you might say uh, you'll leave your money in the bank for a month six months, a year, a few years, etc. And uh, typically when you want to get your money out of a term deposit, you'll have to break the contract. And that might cost you a little bit of interest and it may take a little bit of time, say a day or two. Further down, we have some shares. And in the share market, we might have blue chip shares, mid cap shares or small cap shares. Blue chip shares are at the top of the list because they're most liquid and, um, and they're most liquid because they have many buyers and sellers. So at any one time you could go into a share brokerage account and you could buy and sell blue chip shares. You may not get the exact market price, but you'll get very close to it because there are so many buyers or sellers. Um, and mid cap shares are next. So once again, there are typically many uh, buyers and sellers. Uh, so you should be able to get out of the investment and in, in excluding the, those of you that may have millions of dollars to invest, if you're only investing a few hundred or a few thousand, um, then you'll find that it's very easy to get in and out of these investments when markets are functioning normally. Uh, small cap shares are where uh, are the part of the market where it starts to get a little bit tricky. So if you have a company in Australia with a market capitalization, meaning the entire company is worth less than say 100 or 200 million dollars, you might find that there aren't too many buyers and sellers. So if you hold shares, it may take you a day, maybe two, maybe a week to sell those shares. Uh, conversely, if you're trying to buy shares, you may not get the full amount of your order at the price that you want. So you have to be a little bit calculated in how you set your buy and sell orders when you're dealing with small cap shares. Now we get to the other side of this, I suppose, liquidity spectrum, and we have managed funds. So managed funds, um, as you know, uh, when you invest money with someone um, and then they invest the money for you, so they have a pool of money or a fund and they invest that for you. Nowadays, most managed funds are daily liquid. And by that we mean you can get your money in or out of the managed fund within a day. Uh, and that's especially true for managed funds that are on, listed on the stock exchange, so ETFs um, and active uh, listed funds. However, some managed funds still take time, and by that I mean weeks or months to get money in and out. So some funds um, are still monthly liquid, meaning you can only apply to put your money into the fund once a month, and you can only apply to get your money out once a month. Uh, some are even less so than a month, so some, some are less frequent than, than a month. Um, further down, we have residential property. Now, so if you own a house, for example, you may um, have to decide to list it, you might want to do some repairs, um, you'll contact a, typically contact a real estate agent, uh, and then a conveyancer will get involved and you have to find buyers and etc. The list goes on and that can take anywhere say from a few weeks to many months. So that's a lot less liquid than say blue chip shares, which you can get in and out of typically in a day. Um, commercial property is the last one and this one is um, probably holds a, a place in the memory of many long-term investors or, or older investors who invested throughout periods such as the global financial crisis of 2008, 2009. Um, when you have a commercial property, typically there are very few buyers for a big property, so it's much harder to sell it. 
Um, and so if you did put it on the market, you may get bids that are not very competitive or you don't believe reflect the true value. So it may take months to find the right buyer for your property. Now, many of you will be aware that you can use a managed fund to invest in all of these different asset classes. So a managed fund could hold commercial property or it could hold uh, blue chip shares, for example. When you're investing in these managed funds, you also have to be particularly mindful of what exactly they're investing in. So if they're investing in commercial property, they're still going to suffer from the same illiquidity issues that you might if you invested directly in the property yourself. And um, so to give you an, uh, give you an example, um, during the GFC, many commercial properties were um, very difficult to sell and many investors wanted to get out of their investments, but the managed fund couldn't um, sell their properties quick enough to give investors their cash, so they actually froze. And typically when they freeze like that, um, all, all sorts of troubles start to emerge. And um, what, what we saw was that these funds would be frozen for a year or longer until prices of the, pr the properties come back to some type of normal level and there were buyers and sellers and they could actually sell some of those properties and then give investors their cash. But typically those were at levels much lower than what a normal market price would be. So that's, a, that's where uh, these types of assets are where uh, liquidity or illiquidity, so less liquid investments, these can be very risky. Now conversely, liquidity can also present opportunities for investors. Let's say that um, we're small cap investors and we're going to hold the shares for a very long period of time. We might be able to buy small companies that are very attractive for long-term growth or dividends or what have you, and we might be able to hold those shares um, knowing that there's not going to be much liquidity and knowing that, yes, things may go wrong and it may take a long time to sell, but what we're rewarded with, what we can collect, is, is uh, to use academic speak, we can get a premium, so a, a better return from holding shares that are small, simply because big investors can't get in and out of them because they don't, there's not enough liquidity to go around. There's not enough shares on offer and there's not enough shares to, 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 uh, from sellers or buyers. So you can use illiquidity to your advantage, provided you're aware of the risks. Now, oftentimes when you buy small cap shares, it's very easy to buy them because you can, you can more than, you're more than willing to pay a higher price if you think they're worth more, but when you go to sell them, you have to be mindful that it may take a long time to sell them. For more videos like this, please head to the Rask Finance website. That's www.raskfinance.com.